Okay, welcome back. This place is so quiet, so soothing. I was in a park on Saturday near Southwold, near Sagar, actually. And a mile from the entrance into the woods, I found the same kind of quiet that existed in this room before my lecture. So that's how wonderful you are. Now, I will show you the material that I posted for this week's film, Bonnie and Clyde, from 1967, directed by Arthur Penn. And then, of course, I will introduce the film, possibly show you a scene before the end of the class. We'll see how we're doing in terms of time. Otherwise, I'll do that on Wednesday. As you can see, this is the page for week eight. I'll go through the content and provide a couple of comments. As usual, you find notes about this film. I'll show you that page in just a moment. For this particular film, I took frames at one second intervals. As a result, you have in those three PDF files more than 6,000 frames. I thought it was necessary for this kind of film. And you find the film on Amazon Prime, but there are other platforms where it is streaming, so using Just Watch you can also see alternatives to that. For the reviews, I placed here the entire review from the Hollywood Reporter, the original 1967 review, but there are so many that you can find online for this film. And therefore, after that, I included a section with links sometimes a few excerpts in particular to understand the cultural context of the film which includes the reactions by the critics i recommend especially that you read the first two and some of the others pauline kyle was a very famous um, critic in fact i believe that the film Tarantino, the next film by Tarantino, is based on her. And the most interesting part of this review is her comparison and the information she provides about another film, since Bonnie and Clyde were so famous during their time and became legendary, there have been a handful, more than a handful, of films made on their lives the most famous before Bonnie and Clyde from 1967 is this film by celebrated director Fritz Lang entitled You Only Live Once, where the characters are not named Bonnie and Clyde, but they're loosely based on that criminal duo. Roger Ebert's review is, is interesting because he is raving about the film and he was not the only one and after all the film was nominated for 10 oscars although it only won two and not the most important uh, best supporting actress and cinematography but look look at how the review by the famous critic roger ebert begins Bonnie and Clyde is a milestone in the history of American movies, a work of truth and brilliance, which uh, is, is not exactly aligned with uh, the reactions by modern movie goers. But you have really to be able to understand the movie intellectually, whether you like it or not. You have to place it within the culture of American society during the 1960s, which means human rights, 
which means the Vietnam War and the reactions to uh, that war, right? So it played a role within American society, and that role may be lost on the modern viewer, although the style is still there to be appreciated. It is also pitilessly cruel, filled with sympathy, nauseating, funny, heartbreaking, and astonishingly beautiful. Cruel is actually a reference to the violence in the film, which seems pretty tame by modern standards. Because if there are two things that uh, modern media, not just cinema, but also TV, the internet, are filled with, to the brim, are sex and violence. By modern standards, the treatment of sex in the film is almost ridiculous, or feels that way, and the violence is just ordinary, uh, average. But by the standards of the films, mainstream films uh, produced by Hollywood in the 1960s, the film appeared to offer a lot of blood and violence placed directly to the attention in front of the eyes of the theater goer. And it is true, what you read in the next paragraph by Roger Ebert is quite true about the films of the time. The violence in most American movies is of a curiously bloodless quality, right? People died very quickly. You didn't see a lot of blood. And one of the things that uh, this film employed was one of the first uh, films to do that was to use those uh, small bags with red liquid placed under the clothes of the actors so that when they were shot, you would immediately see blood expanding on their white shirts, etc. People are shot and they die, says Robert George Ebert, but they do not suffer. And even this is quite true. There were a lot of criminal movies that were successful during the 1960s and also during the 1970s, especially films where you see smart criminals endowed with incredible professional talents, the best at, where you have a gang, like the remake of some years ago, The Various Ocean, 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. So you have the best driver, the best at opening safes, uh, the best with guns, etc. They get together for one last heist, but their goal ultimately is to re-enter society. The same society that has not valued their talents and not rewarded their talents professionally, offering them a career, the same society that has marginalized them is ready to accept them as outstanding citizens once they've uh, completed this one last crime, usually against a, gang, a bank or uh, some rich dude, and then they will, and, and it is a pivotal part of these films, the scene where the gang members discuss their future. What are you going to do with your money, with your part of the loot? And usually is uh, I'll open um, some, some kind of, start some kind of commercial activity or uh, I will engage in other creative activities, etc. But again, the goal is for these criminals to return to normal life, to accept the norms of society. Of course, sometimes this doesn't happen. Quite often things go against the uh, dreams. But this is the kind of bloodless tr treatment of crime during this time, right? Where you are supposed to empathize with the criminals you see on the screen because they have these outstanding professional skills. 
because they are so smart. And their heists are usually almost bloodless with limited violence, with a limited amount of violence. Okay, so this is quite different. And the same can be said about the treatment of sex in this film. Notice how in Robert George Ebert's mind, this is pretty clearly the best American film of the year. It is also a landmark. Years from now, it is quite possible that Bonnie and Clyde will be seen as the definitive film of the 1960s, so a film of the decade. And this justifies the number of Oscars the film was nominated for. It was also nominated for, I think, seven Golden Globes. Didn't win a single Golden Globe. It is true, however, that the cast itself if you look at the cast, there were incredible actors, and almost all of them uh, won an Oscar for Best Actor or Best Actress, or more than one, with the exception of Warren Beatty, the guy that plays the part of Clyde, who later on will win an Oscar as director. Uh, and there is a reason, you might say, why, even though he was the... He, he had the lead role in, in dozens of successful films. He never won and, and was nominated several times, never won an Oscar as Best Actor. Even in this film, the best acting you see on the screen is by the female lead, Faye Dinaway. She uh, could have easily won the Oscar. She was nominated for that year. She, she had to wait another 10 or so years until the 1970s when she won an Oscar for Network. And you find here more reviews, even if you don't read those reviews, read these uh, excerpts because they give you a sense of the cultural dimension, the way the film impressed the culture of the time. For example, this paragraph is very relevant for us and for our understanding of the film within the society of the time. The kids, meaning the younger people, not, not really people under 10. The kids loved Bonnie and Clyde, which became a rallying cry for the burgeoning counterculture. And indeed, you have to understand this film within the context of the counterculture that supported the human rights movements and the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War culture of the time, also central to the counterculture, the hippie movement of the 1960s and early 70s was the refusal of the conventional lifestyle of the family. So the family is replaced by the idea of a commune, of a group, of a small group that lives by uh, different rules. And... Uh, traditional corporate work is replaced by the idea of alternative lines of works from agriculture to creative work. Okay? And, of course, it says, might seem counterintuitive since we have gangsters, but 1967 was a time for young people disillusioned with traditionalist culture to run hard in the opposite direction, gleefully flouting laws, and norms about everything from drugs and sex to the right path in life. And this is especially important in order for you to understand the fact that for most of the film, Bonnie and Clyde don't have sex. And although the, this, this, uh, um, the, the, the rejection of the consummation of their relationship with, a sexual, intercourse, with sexual intercourse is, is represented awkwardly, somewhat goofily, by, by modern standards. It is not about his impotence. It is not about his gender identity, although the original script made him into a fluid character. 
into a bisexual character with the original initial inclusion of a sexual scene with two men and the, the female lead. But that was uh, uh, discarded from the production of the film because both the director, Arthur Pan, and the main lead actor, Warren Beatty, didn't want that, didn't want the film to go in that direction. Warren Beatty had a saying in this because he was a producer and, and after this film, he produced a lot of other films. As soon as he made money uh, with films playing the protagonist, Warren Beatty thought it best to use some of this money, reinvest it in films to get freedom, to get a say in how the part he was playing should be, right? He wanted to be in control, okay? So he rejected this idea of Bonnie as a fluid character, yet the idea that they don't engage in sex is, is central to your understanding of counterculture. Because if you have sex, then you have a traditional love story. If you have sex, then you have a couple that, although they're being represented as criminal, will want to settle down, will want to have a future. And the film rejects that as part of a conventional lifestyle. So the rejection of sex is part of that particular theme. Okay. Of course, we're talking about historical characters. So I included a number of links to articles about the real Bonnie and Clyde. Even if you don't want to read uh, all of these, open a few of them, look at the actual pictures. Because what you will see in the film, that is to say that the idea of heroic characters, the potential for the story to become a drama to criminals, against the system, and the system is represented by the banks they rob and by the cops that are chasing them. Uh, even though this is not pursued by the film, and the film favors instead the idea that Bonnie and Clyde are doing what they're doing to get attention, to become known to be recognized, and they take great care in dressing up for their robberies, taking pictures of themselves. Later on, Bonnie will be engaged in poetry making. And this is true, this is accurate. The actual Bonnie was a poet, and you find online a lot of, his po of her poetry, which at the time was sometimes published by uh, the newspapers. This part of the film is just the amplification of something you find in, rooted in real life because we do have photographs, for example, where the actual Bonnie and Clyde are posing like the criminals they saw in the films. Remember that the original Scarface is from 1932. Bonnie and Clyde were starting to become famous in 1932, they will die in 1934. So they themselves were trying to orchestrate the media campaign about themselves, okay? Uh, so look at least at the pictures and in here and also in the notes page, I've included links that allow you to read her poetry, which is interesting. Not great poetry, but certainly interesting. And, and very useful to understand the, the film. The required readings are just a couple, the notes, and there are pages from the film. Uh, there is an entire chapter full of references, but I've highlighted the exact pages where you find the reading, the analysis of the film that is done in the textbook. Keep in mind that this is not a crime drama. And Hollywood did a lot of crime dramas from the 1930s on, especially after the success of Little Caesar, of Scarface. This is a road movie, right? It starts with Clyde 
outside of Bonnie's house or the house of Bonnie's mother, she sees him from the window, calls on him because she thinks he's trying to steal her mother's car, comes down, they start walking towards the center of the town. He robs at to show her he's a real guy, a real criminal, a real hero, robs a grocery store, they steal a car and leave. So it starts on the road and it ends with them dying on the road. Even when they pick up other members of their gang, which is the gang itself is simplified. There were many more in the Barrows gang, uh, but the film simplifies that to, to a total of five. Even when they pick up C.W. Moss to join their gang, they stop at a gas station where C.W. is working. He fills up their car with, with gas. They start talking, Bonnie starts talking to him and recruits him. He goes inside, takes the money from the cashier at the gas station, jumps into their car and leaves. So immediately, without preparation, everything happens on the road. And we can analyze the, this film from the point of view of the Matrix in just a little while. There is another uh, PDF, there is a PDF file where you can find another interesting article about the film. And I added some bibliography. So the assignment for this week is just the usual viewing notes for the film that you place in your Google Docs file by the end of Friday and then read the required reading. This is the page with the notes uh, and my suggestion is focus mostly, focus primarily on the frames that I included. The representative of either the style, the content, or both, and the captions that you find. So the captions in this kind, in, in for this time for, for this kind of page, the captions are more important than the actual notes that you find. The actual notes are where, where my original attempt at providing students with a model for viewing notes. I left them there. Uh, they're not always incisive, the captions have added this time, and they include the analysis of the visual elements in the, shown by the frame itself, okay? And you find a lot of these frames. These are the bullet points notes that I um, was talking about, for example, Look at this frame from the initial scene where she's getting dressed. She was naked because it's hot, it's Texas. And notice how you find in the foreground a sewing machine and prominently in the door of the armoire where she keeps her dresses, a naive drawing of a house. So clearly these are indicative of the normal path for a female member of society, right? To become a housewife, to have a house. And the entire story is about a couple that rejects not only the idea of a regular family, regular house, but they're so unconventional that for most of the film, they don't even engage in sex. Okay, so <clears throat> let me discuss to complete the introduction the various points of what I've called the matrix, which begins with destination, right? If this is road movie, then we can discuss it using these parameters. And of course, it's a destination or destinations. This is a road movie, but it is similar to, more similar to, two-lane blacktop, 
which we discussed and watched scene from the week before the spring recess, in that there is no planned set destination for this couple that takes the road at the beginning of the film and is constantly on the run, of course, hiding, running from the cops, or as they call them significantly, the laws, the representative of the law, because they're the representatives of the system. However, more important than the actual locations, the places where they go, where they end up going, and they, or, or the place where they will be killed, it's more important to keep in mind the fact that you don't find the usual destination, the metaphoric destination for a heroic romantic couple. That would be some kind of life, future, in which they successfully escape from the law and they can settle and they can complete their dream of love, their dream of a perfect love, love, okay? So this is rejected. There is a scene towards the end after they finally engaged in sex where Bonnie, in the bed at night, will say, what if we found a state where we haven't committed any crimes and we found a house and we started a life together, a clean life, and not only clearly is Bonnie not completely believing this. By that point, when that scene happens, this is the night before they are killed by a posse driven by Texas <coughs> Ranger Frank Hammer. Keep in mind that a lot of the people the historical figures from this film were still alive when the film came out, because after all, they were killed in 1934, the film came out in 1937, there were a couple of members of the gang, at least two members of the original Barros gang that were still alive. Uh, the family of Frank Hammer, the Texas Ranger who led the, the posse that killed them, sued the company uh, for uh, their representation of the Texas Ranger in the film and they settled out of court so they got uh, some money but uh, not only is Bonnie not really believing into this this is just a romantic dream because they're about to get killed but Clyde himself says, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We'll find a state where we haven't committed any crimes and then we'll just rob banks around. We'll just move to the neighboring states to uh, continue and engage in our criminal activity. Showing that even though they've consummated their uh, uh, the, the sexual side of their relationship, that is not central to their relationship. Their relationship is about becoming famous as anti-system heroes because the banks are representatives of the system. So in terms of destination, think of the destinations that are not included. Family life, permanent house, settling down, re-entering society. And keep in mind how so many films think, for example, of as, as the precursor of the, of the various Ocean 10, 11 with George Clooney, think of the films with Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr., where they are part of a gang trying this last incredible heist before re-entering society. That's their goal. Doesn't happen in here. The other criterion that we used to evaluate old movies is transformation. From this point of view, you don't really see any kind of radical transformation in the film. Because even that 
would have been embracing culture, conventional culture. Counter culture of the time was not about growing in any kind of way other than developing awareness, right? Counterculture was a precursor to new age. So there are small changes in the characters, but keep in mind that those are not dramatic, radical changes, meaning the masculine, the, the, the main protagonist, Clyde, does not really become more of a man because manages to uh, have sex with Bonnie by the end of the film. He remains childish. He remains immature. He remains a kind of male character, male protagonist, who challenges or is a challenge through his representation to the traditional idea, model of masculine leadership. Because of the two, Bonnie and Clyde, Bonnie is the real leader. Bonnie is resolute. She has the resolve that he lacks. And if you want to find an example of something that approximates a transformation is the fact that she becomes a poet and she becomes a published poet, published in the first page of the newspapers. But even he, Clyde, will acknowledge before the end of the film what she has done for them and for him in particular. He will say, I've done something for you because I've taken you out of your provincial life, your cagey life, right? You see this beautiful frame where the uh, brass uh, metal bars of the head of the bed are like the cage represents the fact that she wants to escape her life. And he says, I've done that for you. I've taken you out of that context. But then Clyde will add, you've done much more for me. You've made me into a legend. Because she has, through her poetry and through the way she interprets her, their social roles, their she has made them into media heroes. And that's what the film is about in a very modern interpretation. Right, the 1960s, uh, especially 1966, is a time where the most famous intellectual scholar of media is Canadian Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan, one of the uh, principles in his famous book, Understanding Media, is the media is the message, right? And in this case, the story is not about people robbing banks even if they do that, but they do that in such a stylish way, with some violence, but in a very stylish way, because what they're doing is getting the attention from the media, and Robin is secondary. What they're doing is becoming media hero, heroes, not criminal heroes. Okay, so that's the most important transformation. We always discuss also the theme of impersonation for road movies. And of course, you find a lot of that here because keep in mind they're constantly pretending, they're constantly posing, they're trying to offer themselves to the attention of the public and society as stylish heroes, ready to be encapsulated in some kind of narrative, of course. This happens in the newspapers because the newspapers with radio were the key media of the time and, and it did happen in real life. Now, since they are also representative of the anti-system movement, you will find a relevant scene in which the people, uh, the 1930s is still the depression era, right? So a lot of people who uh, live a precarious life, at some point they will get with their car to a camp where transient laborers live. People who during the 1930s were doing seasonal jobs and moving from uh, place to place because they lacked the resources to settle down anywhere. And these people will approach them 
at this point in the film, Bonnie and Clyde are both wounded with reverence, with admiration, with respect, because they find them to be closer to their side, being against the bank, and the banks are uh, portrayed in here as the financial institutions that provoke the depression that uh, bankrupted a lot of people uh, that caused uh, suffering in a lot of family. But they're not true heroes. There is a little bit of social justice in the film, but mostly they're trying to pretend they are. Okay, They're trying to offer themselves to the public the way the public would want them to be. And they're pretending from the very beginning, even in the first scene, they're pretending they're acting in front of each other. And it's important to notice that, again, Bonnie, uh, Clyde, Warren Beatty is not a, this, this big kind of hero. And even in the first scene, he says, oh, I'm a big guy, I'm an important guy, I rob banks. But he ends up first robbing a small grocery store. Then, uh, two scenes later, he goes to rob a bank. The first bank we see him robbing goes there. There is a single employee, and there is no money because the bank has just failed. Again, it's the Depression era. And what does he do? Instead of expressing his rage in a masculine way, as you could have seen some heroes do in another kind of movie, he takes the cashier, the bank employee, out of the bank and he says, come, takes him to the car where Bonnie, Faye Dunaway, is waiting to get away, right, to drive away, takes the employee to talk to them and explain to her that there is no money. Explain to her that it is not his own failure that is not bringing any money from this robbery, but it is just the circumstances. Later on, we find them after their first murder, in the jury, that happens during the second uh, bank robbery. They find refuge, they hide in a theater, in a cinema theater, and um, we'll see them talking about what happened and how this murder will change their prospects, right? Now there is no coming back. There is no hope for forgiveness or for a relatively short prison sentence and then re-entering society. But they're doing it while on the screen we see a famous film from 1933, The Gold Diggers of 1933, singing a Broadway song, We Are In The Money. Okay, And right after this, we'll see Bonnie trying some jewelry in front of a mirror and singing the same song from the musical film. So they're acting a lot in the film. The other criteria is the road. And as I said, they're always on the road. They're constantly on the road, changing cars, spending a lot of time inside the cars. There are entire scenes that are shot inside the cars. And they're visiting the same kind of places or non-places that we find in plenty of road movies, such as road motels. The banks themselves are a kind of non-place or houses they rent temporarily in between, for, for a short period of time, in between hits, in between <coughs> robberies. Um, of course, on the road, they will have to endure the surprise attacks by the police. They will be attacked multiple times, and eventually uh, the, the, the final attack will be successful, and both will be killed. The car, the actual car uh, where they died, it's a Ford with a V8 engine. <coughs> they, they loved cars with powerful engines, is inside a casino in Nevada, and I included the link to a YouTube video where you can see the cars and you still find the bullet holes from the original attack, as well as there is around a, a number of 
collectible memorabilia from that time, uh, pages with their handwriting, guns used by them, etc. And the last criteria is the, the questions, the, the holes, the narrative holes that provide some expansion. For this film, you don't find a lot of them, but there are some question marks that you have to keep in mind. You have to ask yourself, what is this film about? And pay attention to the aesthetics of the film. And you know right away that this film is not a crime drama. Of course, the other question mark is, why aren't they having sex? And again, the answer that the film intends to provide is not his impotent, is, it's not his bi or fluid or gay. Rather, it's a counterculture model where rejecting sex means rejecting the traditional model of the family, the traditional model for uh, the couple, right? And pursuing an alternative kind of lifestyle, okay? So, we do have enough time to see some of the films. Let's look at the first scenes. And perhaps we can lower the shades in the back. Shut down the lights. This is Bonnie, this is Faye Dunaway. Again, beautiful interpretation, great acting by her. 